Hey everyone, Nick from Pragley Tactical. Thank you for tuning in. The video you're about to see is from 2017 at our Pragley Tactical Unthinkable Listener Class with Dr. William April and Paul Sharp. For those that are unfamiliar, unfortunately, Dr. William April passed away from a medical issue last year. He was a great asset to the community and brought a lot of very important knowledge on self-defense and violent criminal actors. This video from 2017 has very poor audio quality. Unfortunately, the building we we're in was all metal and it creates a lot of interference with the mics that we were using. At that point in time, there was no video release of this due to the audio quality. However, I was going through videos, found this, and ran it by the Shivworks Collective crew, and we got approval to post it. So I apologize that the video is not that great in regards to the audio quality. However, the content in this video, the 50 minutes, is top-notch. Dr. William April was by far a huge asset to the self-defense community for the topics that he discussed. So sit back, get a notepad, get a pen, and take some notes to where if you never had the opportunity to, to train with Dr. William April, you were gonna get 50 minutes of his presentation, which again, it's not all of it. However, the information in here is absolutely phenomenal, and I hope it goes to go on towards the legacy of what Dr. William April brought to the self-defense and firearms and training community. Uh, William, you are still missed, my friend. But again, I wanna thank uh, the Shiverworks Collective crew for checking us out and allowing us to release it. So for everybody out there uh, to help continue William April's legacy, uh, please share this video again from the 2017 Unthinkable, Pro Unthinkable Practically Tactical Listener Class at Alliance Ohio with Dr. William April and Paul Sharp. The amount of knowledge in here definitely needs to be shared. I hope you enjoy this video. Take care. Anyway, again, my name is William April, just call me William. I'm an old fashioned, I think, doctor is for physicians. I'm a mid career mental health professional from New Orleans, Louisiana, right? Uh, this is my 20th year working in mental health. Um, wow. Um, I, uh, I didn't get here through, uh, through any master plan. I went away to college, like most folks. After three years of college, I got kicked out. Um, if you drink all the time and never study, I don't know if college doesn't work that well. Um, so I got kicked out of school and I went back home and I, I needed a job. And my godfather was a police officer in New Orleans, where I'm from. And he said, Well, I can get you on the sheriff's office. You go down to the sheriff's office, you know, three years of college. Wow, that's, that's a lot for them. So, okay. So I got a job at the sheriff's office, the regular sheriff's deputy. I worked in the worst jail in America, the Orleans Parish Prison. Uh, I got promoted to court security, got promoted to patrol. Then I got a job while waiting around in court with the U.S. Marshal Service. And I worked for the Eastern District of Louisiana. Louisiana looks kind of like a sock. The Eastern District is the parishes that are the kind of the toe. Uh, and I worked there uh, doing mostly prisoner transportation, uh, court security, and seizures and asset forfeitures. I once seized a 900-foot container ship. Which, uh, I couldn't believe it floated. You walk up to it and you're like, this thing floats. <laughs> Literally 40 stories tall. And when you, when you seize one, it's not exactly like dagger in the teeth time. You take the keys and put a sticker on the door. So that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't that exciting to me. And by the way, I thought it was going to be like Yo-Ho-Ho and a bottle of rum. You know, like, Arr, you know, uh -uh, it was a joystick. That's what you steer it with. I was like, that drives the boat? You guys like, yeah. But uh, I worked for the marshal's office for a while, long enough to realize I didn't really want to do law enforcement as a career. So I went back to college, and I found out that if you study, it's real easy. <laughs> you know, if you go to class every now and again, that helps a lot. Expert testimony, a couple of death penalty cases, not that many, but we'll talk about some of them. Uh, and a whole lot of interviews of incarcerated bad guys, right? Uh, a couple thousand of them at this point, maybe 5,000 or such. So. Uh, interviews with folks, just bad, bad people. Um, and uh, asked them a lot of questions, took a lot of notes, and, and we'll, we'll share quite a bit of that. Um, I went to my first training class in 1988. I got lucky. The, the first thing I ever went to was Masada Youth's LFI 1. I had heard it was really good, and so I went, you know, it was 40 hours long right off the bat. And I just got lucky, you know, good, good training right off the bat. Um, and he said something that really put the hook in me. He said, uh, you can never really understand a subject, really understand it, until you're certified to teach it. Because only a certified instructor has to be able to answer every single crazy question that the maniac beginner can come up with. And I said, oh, okay. 
So from 88 to 2010, I just chased certifications all over the country. I took between one and six formal training courses a month. It just went nuts. And that's all I did, really, was just, just trying. Uh, and one day I was down in Florida, helping Mass teach an LFI 3 course, I think it was an MAG 80. And uh, he said, hey, would you do a block on post-traumatic stress disorder? I said, well, sure. I mean, that's what I do for a living. I can do that, you know, pretty straightforward. And that's just how I got started. Started teaching for Mass, and then other people would hear about it and say, hey, can you come do that here, and conferences, and things like that. I started teaching uh, part-time about five, six years ago, and then full-time uh, about three years ago. So that's how I wound up here. No master plan, I promise. Uh, private practice mental health during the week, and then uh, most of the weekends here. Things like this. So, those violent criminal actors we'll be talking about. Um, a violent criminal actor is a real subset of criminals, right? They're not bothered by violence, and there's a reasonable expectation that they're going to do violence every day. Right? Um, you know, the violent criminal actor is not put off by violence. His crimes include violence a lot of the time. You know, violence is just a tool, right? And uh, there's certainly no qualms about doing violence, right? Um, the number one thing that you'll notice about violent criminal actor um, behavior is there's no compunction about violence. You'll see crimes that are terribly, terribly efficient, but hyper-violent, um, you know, because the violence just speeds everything up, right? There's not a whole lot of negotiation or anything like that. So you're a subset of criminal that's focused on violence. I promise I'll never ask you a rhetorical question. So what's the difference between a target and a victim? This used to be called victim selection, but now we call it target selection. Oh, what's it's the difference? Got it. It's not a victim until it's actually over. Well, yeah, that's, that's pretty close, you know. Um, unless it's some obscure financial crime, right? You'll know when you've been victimized, right? Somebody steps up behind the ATM, hits you with a socket wrench, you're the victim, right? Even with a financial crime, one day you'll open your bank statement and go, damn, the Russians took my money, right? Um, but will you know you've been targeted? Not necessarily. One of the most surprising things I learned from, from criminals first time working through the jail was that they're forever picking people and then unpicking them. I just assumed it was kind of like a dog, you know, if they see a steak on the ground, they don't say, well, maybe later. No, they grab it and eat it, right? And I just assumed it worked the same way. See an opportunity for crime, they just do it. Mm -hmm. They're forever picking and unpicking, picking and unpicking. But it's almost always a process of exclusion. What we mean by that is they'll pick someone until something that makes that person excludable comes up, whatever it might be. Um, and that really interested me. So we've spent quite a bit of time since then working on what that is. So the, the good guys and the bad guys we're interested in, right? And for our purposes, VCAs and targets, people that they're targeting. We're kind of interested in what's going on on the inside quite a bit. The processes that they go through, especially when they're interacting, real interested in that. But how they get there, we're not really going to talk about this tomorrow. Basically, how does a bad guy get bad? We're going to talk quite a bit about that tomorrow. Uh, and it's pretty important. Uh, the two days grossly, if you want to think about it. Um, today, we're going to try and get, get your mind up, up to the point where you're aware of something that you probably weren't aware of when you started talking, which is that you are in the game of being targeted every day. You don't think you are. Most of us tend to think that we step in and step out of a risk pool, like you step in and step out of a shower. Oh, well, I'm doing some. How many people do you know when you say, hey, you don't, you don't carry a gun? I'm just going to the store. They've decided that that's not dangerous, so they don't need a gun, right? Um, and one of the things that we're after is to think that you don't decide when you're being targeted. You don't get to decide when somebody's looking at you to, to exploit you um, with physical force. They do. Um, so today we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about how that happens and, and so we can get up to speed. But tomorrow we're going to be talking about the speed at which the game is played. And we're going to talk about the players themselves and how they get there. And we've got to get up to the speed of the world, or we'll pay the price. All right. Questions or comments? Where are we going? Nothing good. Uh, we're going to take a break about you know, about every hour or so. But if you need to run to the head in between, don't don't wait for me. Don't ask permission to stay at the gallery. All right. I'm going to start off with a little a little dry, but not too bad. I hope. In all the tests I ever had to take, books I had to read, exams, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the words sane and sanity never come up. Those are not words that are used in my business. They're just not. They're terms for court. Lawyers are forever asking people like me to decide if somebody's sane or not, which is funny because we don't do that. 
The only time we ever do it is when lawyers ask us to. And yet they're bringing us in as experts. It's really kind of weird. To me, it's like a shoe shine guy pulling you over and saying, am I doing this right? Why the hell would I know? You're the one that shines shoes all day. But it happens all the time. Now, in a group like this, I don't expect a whole lot of sympathy for mental health defenses, right? Uh, you know, not guilty by reason of insanity, diminished capacity, stuff like that. But let's be honest. I think all of us would agree that there are people out there who are so mentally ill that it's just not fair to hold them to the same standards that you should be held to, right? Well, not Paul, but the rest of you should be held to, right? Not the Menendez brothers. By the way, there's a miniseries coming out about the Menendez brothers this year. So check it out. I know somebody went to high school with them. <laughs> That's a weird. Uh, or the Twinkie defense or crazy stuff like that. You know, I, I killed my parents because they brought me the wrong color BMW for my birthday. You know, that kind of stuff. Nobody's buying that. I'm talking about the homeless schizophrenic that you see in town every now and then, right? He lives behind the strip mall in a dumpster, walking down the street, holding a dead fish in one hand, combing his hair with a turf, right? Is it fair to judge him as harshly for trespassing as we should be judged for trespassing? Right? Come on, man, let's be honest. And, and we got to come out with a about two things. Mental health defenses, like, I'm crazy, so you should let me off, right? They're very rarely used, and they very rarely work. People try it all the time, but, you know, their lawyers will go, no, nah, it just doesn't work. It's very, very hard to do in court, so it's not like there's some wave of, of people getting off a crime because they're claiming that they're uh, mentally ill. Now, sentencing, that's a whole different kettle of fish. But convictions, very rarely do they turn on mental health issues. But what matters to these court people, I've, I've come to learn, <laughs> is one thing and one thing only. Does the person appreciate that their actions are wrong? That's the only thing that matters in court for sanity. Do they understand that what they did is considered by the mass of people, not themselves, but the mass of people, to be wrong? Right? Because only if you know it's wrong can you be judged for doing it. Right? Like here's a good example that was a death penalty case I got to work on. In Louisiana, the aggravated rape of a child under the age of 12, so you know, a little bitty child, uh, used to be a death penalty offense even if the child didn't die, which I thought was perfectly great. Uh, the Supreme Court struck that down, so it's no longer legal, right? You have a death penalty for a child, a child rape even if the child didn't die. But one case I got to work on was a guy who had, was being accused of raping a 10-year-old girl in a little bitty hick town outside of New Orleans. You know those convenience stores that have two drink machines out in front of them? You know those ones if you're driving down the road, like especially country areas, and they'll be, you know, stop and rob kind of store, but then there'll be drink machines outside in the front? Why are they there? I'm actually asking. If somebody knows, please tell me. Because I mean, the, store the, store open, right? well, the stores are open, and they sell drinks. What do they have drink machines outside? I, I don't get it. It's like you're turning customers away for whatever. <coughs> this guy had figured out that he fit between the drink machines. And he would sort of slide in like a piece of bread into a toaster and just sit there in this little gap created between these two drink machines. And when people would come up to buy a drink, he would materialize out of the darkness and ask to borrow some money. And people would freak out and run away. I mean, drop the money on the ground. He'd pick it up and you know, get back in the little hole. Well, he was in there one day doing his thing, and this little 10-year-old girl walks up to use a drink machine. Uh, he steps up from the space in the dark, grabs her by the hair, beats her unconscious, drags her in the back of the store, rapes her by the dumpster, and stuffs her body in the dumpster. Then he gets gets up, walks back to the front of the store, and goes right back to his little spot. He was still standing there when the sheriff's office rolled up and threw a net over his, a net over his head. And his lawyer said, he didn't even try to get away. He must be. I said, okay, sure. Two things in my business. One, you always get the check first. And two, you always deposit it before you go make your appointment. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a check from a law firm, brought it to the bank, and in the hour that took, they've stopped payment on the check. Don't even get me started about lawyers. But this check clears, so I go to the bank, uh, drop it off, um, go out to the jail to interview this guy. And what most made-up stories of mental illness sound like is, I have perfect recall of events right until this moment, then I can remember nothing until over here, then I have perfect recall from here going forward. What happens in between is what we call the crime, right? <laughs> and they never do seem to remember any of that. That's unbelievably rare, legitimately. It's called acute episodic amnesia, and it's just very, very, very rare. But they're all latched onto it as their story. And But when you try to get the story from people who are claiming that, if you just keep nibbling around the edges, they'll give away more and more information. They perfectly well remember what happened. 
this guy's story was, uh, he remembers a little girl walking up the drink machine, then he doesn't remember anything until he's getting arrested. He didn't even know why he was getting arrested. He was very confused. Well, as we talk and talk and talk, he just kind of lets more and more information slip. And so I asked him a question. I said, hey, uh, why the back of the store? You know, why by the dumpster? Why in the little enclosure on the dumpster? What was the answer he gave that proved he was sane? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was he a little bit hot? If he's trying to hide it from sight, if he's trying to conceal what he's doing, it means he knows it's wrong. If he knows it's wrong, he's insane, right? Fifteen minutes, fifteen hundred dollars, right? Great. <laughs> Greatest day of my professional life, right? I mean, that was awesome. We're gonna report that long because that's all that matters. He knew it was wrong. Now, I don't, you know, I'm not saying he's well or whatever, but he's sane. By the, you know, by the standards courts want to use, he's sane. So that was that. But that's what we're talking about, volitional behavior, meaning that it was his will, his choices to do it, not something that's driven by such mental illness that it's really just a symptom. Make sense? Good. Any criminologists in the room? Lawyers, criminologists, we're working our way down the list. One day a criminologist is going to take this class and we're going to have a big old fight. <laughs> um, about two-thirds of positivists, uh, excuse me, criminologists, identify themselves as positivists. Positivist social scientists really believe that crime is not a choice or a thing that people do, but it's a force in the world that is expressed through people. And I would say, so crime is a ghost <laughs> or an evil spirit? And they say, well, stop, you know, stop talking crazy. And I say, you first, right? <laughs> Seriously. They really do believe that the environment causes crime. Like the design of buildings, the layout of streets, things like that, the way cities are laid out, causes crime. Now, if I asked you to build a building that made crime more likely, you could do that, right? Lots of dark corners, lots of places to hide and jump out on people, lots of ways to get away. They can cause, like if you take a perfectly normal person like your grandma and put her in this building, eventually grandma gets real, right? She'll start, she'll start committing crime. They really do. That's the face. They got, they got feng shui or something. Like that. Yeah, exactly. It's got to be some kind of perverse feng shui. That's all I can say. Grandma will only take one candy. <laughs> but they really do believe this sort of stuff can happen. Then will cause crime. Well, you know, we're, we're a lot more interested in in what used to be called classical criminology, right? Which is the fact that crime is just a choice, like any other. What were you going to say, Paul? Remember when we talked about the uh, the layout of the apartment building? Well, no, I don't listen to you. I know. He was sleeping. Uh, a perfect example for guys that haven't been exposed to this stuff. Um, we'll talk about it more later. When I worked as a resident officer, when they pick a neighborhood at risk, and they put you in there, you have to give them an 18-month commitment. And um, I stayed there for five years. Most guys last like eight months. That's why they put the 18-month commitment on there. And uh, we had a criminologist and a sociologist come out to ride with us to help us problem solve. And her recommendation was uh, the Section 8 housing project that was in my neighborhood was too much like prison. So, of course, they're going to act like prisoners. Mm -hmm. So, and we violate to one another. So, we, uh, she proposed this plan to the city for almost $11 million. So, they did it. They went for it, put it in shrubs, lighting, flowers. The very next night, they had a shooting or a triple murder. And she was riding up, and I looked over and I go, now what? She was, well, obviously, you guys still have the environment in place. We don't do something else. Yes, you're not doing it right. Like, she, she couldn't have ran and bottle people were going to Does everybody know what uh, sodium street lights look like? That yellowy yeah. street yeah. light? That's a, uh, sociologists call them prison lights. They say it makes the neighborhood look like prison. And she said the lighting wasn't bright enough. Yeah. The reason mm -hmm. that sodium lights are used is because they're mm -hmm. cheap. Right? And uh, you know, cities use them because they're cheap, not because it looks like prison. Hey, how are you? Um, but so, if you think about classical criminology, right, we're basically saying that crime is a choice, a series of choices. And people make choices, right? Not ghosts or spirits or forces in the universe. But if I wanted to control your choices, I start on the inside of you, not on the outside of the world, right? And if I wanted to influence your choices, I can really do it with two things, consequences and rewards. Right? Consequences generally work better, only if there are, though, Certain, severe, and timely. Like, this is, what, what county is this? Star County. Okay. What's the penalty for speeding around here? 
if you're driving, you know, in your car and you're exceeding the posted speed limit, what's the penalty for speeding? How uh, fast are you going? Uh, see, that's a lawyerly answer. <laughs> <laughs> A ticket. A ticket is the penalty for speeding in front of a cop who feels like writing you a ticket. What's the penalty for exceeding the speed limit in your car? Nothing. Nothing. So we all do it every day. But let's say next week the sheriff has had it. There's going to be no more speeding in this county, goddammit. And the penalty becomes if you exceed the speed limit by even one mile an hour, they'll pull you over, drag you out of the car, beat you bloody on the side of the road, leave you spread eagle on the hood like a deer. All right? And you see this happening. It happens to you, maybe. You go to work Monday, some guy's got a black eye. You say, what happened? Oh, I'm speeding by the mall. Would you speed in this day? <laughs> oh, no. right? uh-uh. But think about the death penalty, right? The end of the road, the most severe. Oh, well, that's terribly severe, right? Is it certain? If you kill somebody, you're going to get the death penalty. Not to bag on Chicago, small hometown, but in Chicago last year, 13% of murders saw someone arrested. This year, it's 8% falsehoods. Think about that. You kill somebody, there's only a 13% chance you'll ever see the inside of a police car, much less convicted, much less get the death penalty. So certain, no. But timely, every death penalty story you've ever read, Bob Jones was executed yesterday for the 1989 slaying of, nobody remembers the case. The guy's kids are adults now, nobody remembers anything. Death penalty doesn't change anybody's behavior. All it does is waste money. From my point of view, you should file these people away in a big metal box and forget their names. But another slice of criminology that makes me think they're truly insane is what the corruption of something called opportunism. Opportunistic crime used to mean that there was an opportunity to commit a certain crime. Now it's come to mean almost random. Um, but think about it. Is a guy walking down the street trying every car door, doing random behavior? Sometimes. That's systematic behavior. He's trying every car door he passes. Somebody leave a camcorder in the car and it's just checking. What you'll hear from criminologists is that, you know, the person is sort of swimming through the world like a shark. And the way sharks eat is they, they bump into something, they take bite out of it. Right? They figure out if it's food later. Well, criminals don't work like that. One thing from the UK that I think is important to think about that, that lays out this crazy frame of mind this is what they call the routine activities theory. The routine activities theory says that if I have a potential offender, a suitable target, and an ineffectual guardian, I'll get crime. Well, ineffectual guardian means there's nobody in the room interested in stopping the crime right now, right? But who's a potential offender? Everybody in the world, maybe, right? Who's a suitable target? Everybody in the world. I mean, you know, I don't mean it seriously, but raise your hand if you brought less than five thousand dollars worth of guns to this class. If I go down to three thousand, there won't be any hands. <laughs> Why aren't you guys killing each other? You're all potential offenders. You're all good targets. Why aren't you killing each other? Because they all have guns. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't matter. I know. Shouldn't matter. Yeah. Maybe you're not killing each other because you're not criminals. I'm just saying. What used to be big, and now is fading out, was what was called rational choice theory. This is a big driver in like behavioral economics. How do rewards and consequences influence people's behavior, right? And under that old theory, we had to look at criminal offenders in some very specific ways. The first was that they have values, beliefs, ethics, and morality. We tend to go, oh, no, they don't. They don't have any morals. They don't have any ethics. That's why they do all this terrible stuff. Rumble, rumble, rumble. Well, they do. They just don't share any of yours. Right? If you want to see somebody truly morally offended, steal from a thief. They can't believe it. They are truly shocked. Well, somebody took my stuff? My stuff? Why do you think you hear these stories all the time and we all shake our heads? Somebody had their weed stolen and they called the cops. <laughs> Somebody had their drugs or drug money stolen and they called the cops. They're outraged. What? This guy broke into my house. He stole my crack. <laughs> cops are like, we'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you hear it all the time. Uh, I, hey, somebody stole my car. Do you have the registration? Well, uh, it's a stolen car. They're mad that somebody stole their stolen car. You know, I mean, uh, 
crazy. So they, they work within uh, a value system, it's just not one that they share with us, right? Um, they constantly are gathering information from their environment just like you are, right? Working with environmental constraints, right? A fancy pants way of saying you'll never see a carjacking of a marked police car. Right? You should. If you think about hardcore modern criminological theory, you should see it. Think about it. It's, a, it's full of valuable stuff. Radios, computers, guns, two dudes asleep, donut powder all over them, right? I mean, it's full of valuable stuff. But you don't. You don't see people carjacking marked police cars. You know? It's dangerous. Yeah. That's, that's, you said that's the only reason, just because it's dangerous. Why else would you not? I mean, it's not like the rule of law changes their behavior. It's just dangerous. Because they're constantly looking for data, and the data is really about risk and rewards, right? Cost and benefits. The only question that comes up for a real violent criminal actor is, is it worth it? Not, is it right? Is it wrong? Not even, can I get away with it? It's, is it worth it? Basically means, do the risks, you know, are they palatable or tolerable given the rewards for this thing that I want to do? That's all they're thinking about. Is it worth it? The rest of the stuff we might think about, is it right? Is it wrong? Is it good? Is it bad? It doesn't enter into it. Just, is it worth it? And that makes them look pretty weird to us, right? Because we're used to having all kinds of other factors figure into our decisions. And so we think of folks like this as irrational or impulsive. But if you look at them closely enough, they're not. The problem is when you look at their behavior, you're judging it compared to your behavior. What would you do? What do you see as palatable or doable or even conceivable? Like, uh, it, I could make up a hypothetical where you'd steal. It's pretty straightforward. There's a famous one in the psychological literature it's been administered to like, I think over a half a million people all around the world. Your child has some rare illness. There's one person in your town that has a disease, uh, has a cure that will cure the illness. Uh, if the child doesn't get it tonight, they'll die. The person will not sell you the medicine, they will not give you the medicine, they will not trade you the medicine, they're just keeping it. Will you break into the drugstore and steal the medicine tonight? <laughs> we administered that test around the world. 90% of people, different cultures, say yes. The other 10% are lying. Nobody is going to be pacing outside the drugstore going, man, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Nobody's going to sit there and look at child die. Just nobody. But could I make a hypothetical where you killed somebody? Let's say where you tortured somebody to death. Some people will go, yo, uh, I don't know. When I duct tape them to the table and hand you the blowtorch and the pliers, I, I don't know. A lot of people can't do that. That's good, by the way. <laughs> you know, that's good that you can't do that. But if nothing else, the hypothetical would be a lot harder for me to build, yes? For you to actually torture someone to death, that'd be a pretty tough hypothetical to build. So when you read in the paper about some guy I tortured some other guy to death, drug dealers or something, you, it's too easy to say, man, the guy to do that, he's got to be. He's got to be, right? Because we can't see ourselves doing it. But he can't. He doesn't have a problem with it. And if you look at folks that are called crazy all the time, here, here's a hint from inside the business. We always say, he may be crazy, but he's not crazy crazy. Right? <laughs> um, folks that are referred to as crazy all the time really aren't, if you look at them with any level of attention. Think about a rapist. Rapist is all about picking. What, what happens to a rapist who picks wrong? Oh, I know women who are a Waiting for somebody to try and rape them, and they're going to kill them as dead as fried chicken. I mean, it's not even going to be funny. They are waiting, and it's going to be a slaughter. What a mugger! What a mugger picks wrong. Think about Rex Applegate, 85 years old, he used to go walking around town in the middle of the night trying to get mud. Beat two guys nearly to death when he was 85 in Seattle, and they mugged him down there. Beat him almost to death. Uh, Mass is a really good friend at this point. Showed up for class one year with a cane. I said, Mass, what happened? He slipped in his carport and had a really badly sprained ankle. I said, Mass, that's not fair. I said, that's hunting over a baited field. You know, he's an older guy, not that big. Now he's got the cane. I said, somebody's going to try and take you off. He said, I know. <laughs> I mean, you know this is great, right? And the person that tries to pick him is going to be the last and the worst 0.75 seconds of their life, right? It's going to suck. Residential burglars, you know, looking around this room, I'm not, well, I'm not going to point out who I think it is, but somebody in here has got like a 4570 Gatling gun in their living room mounted, pointed out the back door. 
Uh, not, not you, sir. Like you. 1919. Yeah, whatever. Or, <laughs> or 30 cal, you know, water cooled, you know. Water cooled. Yeah. And somebody's going to rob your house, and what's going to happen? Right? You're going to get shot with ribbons. Sheriff's office is going to show up and say, where'd he go? And you say, oh, that's him. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, armed robbers, right? What's uh, wh Where's the closest 7-Eleven? got to be right here somewhere. But when you walk into the 7-Eleven and even imply that you've got a gun, what are they supposed to do? Money. Give you the money. By the way, 7-Eleven not only fires employees who resist, they've started suing them. There's a case in Tennessee where a guy carried a gun to work at 7-Eleven because he's working at 7-Eleven. People tried to rob a store. He pulled out the gun, kind of shot one of them, drove another one off, fired, and sued. 7-Eleven sues them. Sues them. By the way, Southland Corporation, the company that owns almost every 7-Eleven in the world, is the world's largest consumer of third-party life insurance. They insure the lives of the cashiers so that they get paid if the cashiers get killed. Uh, Silly me. I think of that as a conflict of interest. <laughs> Uh, you can't resist, and if you get killed, I get paid. <clears throat> hmm. It's no different than having life insurance on a white and eight. Right. <laughs> Is there another kind of one? <laughs> <laughs> what was the damage they were suing under? Was it oh, they'll, they'll sue for a loss, uh, loss of reputation. They'll, sue, they'll, sue, they'll literally sue you for the bad publicity. They'll say the only reason the cops came here is because you should, you know, but if you hadn't turned this regular robbery into a shooting, Nobody would have noticed. We would never have, they would never would have smeared our game. Crazy. Have been successful so far? Who knows? That one happened last year. I imagine it's still pending. But think about the poor bastard who just lost his job, almost got killed, managed to survive, then loses his job, then gets sued. Like, he's got a lawyer? He doesn't probably have enough money. I mean, it's ridiculous. But there's another convenience store. I bet there's one within five miles of where we're standing. Uh, it's a whole lot different. The family that runs it, and it's always a family, they just got off the boat. Right? The whole family works in the store. They're saving all the money to send the kids to college and become a handful engineer. Somebody from the family sleeps in the back room every night just to make sure nobody robs the place. Right? If you walk in there and point a gun at them, will they give you the money? They'll give you all the free bullets you want, though. <laughs> right? um, that kind of store, you pick it thinking it's a walkover like a 7 Eleven, you'll get killed. Right? What an active drug addict. Who do they choose to exploit? Well, that's a pretty common answer, but not really. Other drug addicts are pretty slick. Family and friends. If I, as a total stranger, come to your grandma's house and tell her that the TV needs to have the oil changed, and so I take the TV and sell it for drugs, will she call the cops on me, a total stranger? Yeah. yeah. What about her nephew, though? Great kid, just about to turn his life around. When he takes the TV because it needs to get waxed and sells it for drugs, she can call the cops on him? Not a chance. You know who to exploit. And I got to interview one legit serial killer in the classic serial killer mode of what we call sexual sadist. Um, he got caught because he broke his own rule that he called the rule of two, which was never commit more than one crime in the same jurisdiction. Right? We don't have counties, we have parishes, but it's the same thing. Uh, he would kidnap women, uh, usually truck stop prostitutes, crackheads, stuff like that, in one parish take him to another parish before he would beat and torture and rape them, take him to another parish to kill them, another parish to dispose of their bodies, and another parish to dispose of their personal effects. Sound crazy to you? Sounds mm -hmm. hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He knows damn good well that people don't talk across lines, right? <clears throat> Call it linkage blindness. Uh, he only got caught because he became convinced that he had forgotten a necklace on the body of his last victim. And he went back to look for it, and a very, very slick young detective in a, in a place called Vermilion Parish, Louisiana. Isn't that great? When they found the body just off I-10, he said, this has to be a serial killer. So they sat there, and he took, took the body, put a man head in the, bush, in the bushes, sat there and waited. And he actually came back, and they thought. Uh, he was tried and convicted for three murders, but he was pretty upfront about having killed at least 70 women. And he'd still be doing it right now if he hadn't broken his own rules. He's crazy, but he's not crazy, crazy. Let's watch it happen in real life. Okay, give me a What is that place? Look at that. Yeah. Almost. It's one of those oil change joints. Mm -hmm. You know, you drive over that thing there, and there's dudes underground to change your oil. What time is it? 621, right? The oil change joint is closed. Okay. 
What is that place? Where, where are we located here? It's in Florida. It's kind of the back of a strip mall. Right? As it turns out, there's a residential neighborhood over there and a residential neighborhood down here. And kids use the back of this strip mall to cut through to go to their friend's house back and forth, right? So let's watch how it happens. Now, be honest, would you have called the cops if you saw that from half a block away? First time I saw it, and I, I, I kind of thought it had a mental caption, and the caption was, oh, somebody's in trouble. She was supposed to be home an hour ago, and her dad is pissed. No. It looks like you want to work there. Okay, it for, like for our purposes, it's over, right? Hers, not so much. Tortured, raped, and murdered a 10-year-old girl named Carly Brucia. Who's there? It's a bizarre kind of place in that it's totally deserted except for kids. It's managed to find a place that's totally deserted except for kids. So the guy who did it, Joseph Smith, and middle initial, no, okay, middle initial is P. Joseph P. Smith. He looked like a nice guy, a 10 year old girl you want to hang out with, talk about my little pony, and maybe make some paper dolls and shit. No. He's a big, angry dad looking dude, though. Yeah? And do me a favor, watch it again. But tell him, and tell me, what does he do physically, and what's he wearing? He gets right in her space physically. He gets right in her face physically. Did anybody see the dad grab? Yeah. You know, you always get dad grab right about the elbow. What's he wearing? Oh, I'm not sure. Right like over the the right the right 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 right. Almost like he could work. Right. I'm sure it said Joe. Right. Um, he's not talking, by the way. Uh, his conviction was overturned. Uh, he had no criminal record before this event. And minor drug stuff, possession, you know, public intoxication, stuff like that. No, nothing violent. It doesn't got caught yet. If he had been smart enough to take a BB gun to that camera, he never would have got caught. He got caught. It wasn't hard. People, you know, they ran the tape all over the, you know, people knew. Oh, yeah, I know that guy. But he's no genius. <laughs> I mean, his conviction was overturned because he had ineffective counsel. He was reconvicted by the state. Um, but if you think about it, he used what he has. He's a big, angry dad looking dude. And I'm convinced, though he's not talking, he walked right into her space and said, What are you doing back here? And she's a nice girl, so she said, I, 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 I. He said, Come with me. Well, we know lots of girls that wouldn't have gone along with that come up and grab them, and they don't know who you are, it's on, but not this one. By the way, this case just refuses to die. This is a, a back in July, just, just you know, a month and change ago. Um, his death sentence was vacated, so he's been convicted, overturned, reconvicted, sentenced to death, now he's going to have to be resentenced again. His case just will not die. Um, but he... Uh, had no real criminal record before that. And his defense was, I don't remember anything. Not a very compelling defense. Um, but, you know, what he did was he used the attributes that he had. Think about Ted Bundy, right? the famous serial killer, Ted Bundy, right? <clears throat> he killed college girls, he liked that. Um, and the way he would do it was, he would go to a, a started killing girls in Utah, he would go to the, the park where pretty girls would jog, he'd put on a fake cast, a big cast, and then very publicly struggled to put something in his car. He'd pick it up and drop it, and pick it up and drop it, and pick it up and drop it, until a pretty college girl would say, can I help you with that? And then guess what? Well, it worked because Ted Bundy was really good looking. Would college girls stop and help him out? <laughs> no, look at it. So had he tried that, it wouldn't have worked. What he tried worked, because it used what he's got. You know, he used the attributes that he had. He's no genius, but he used his instrument very, very well. And he picked the victim very, very well. He did a few things right, but those things that he did are really important. And that's why he was successful in committing his crime. Now, if you think about it, 
it, it falls really well under, under something that comes out of the UK. Target selection is a process that requires dynamic cognitive processing of tremendous amounts of blah, 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 blah. Basically, if you want to commit a crime, you got to make three, you get three questions to answer. Proximity. Where do I get what I want? If you want money, you got to go to a bank or an armored car company. Well, if you want a sexually subjugated murder, a preteen girl, you got to find a place that has those. And if you think about it, he found a perfect place, completely deserted, except for kids. If you'd taken a BB gun to that camera, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yield. Will my, will what I'm capable of render what I want? It worked. If he had tried to sweet talk that girl, she wouldn't have given him the time of day. So he picked a strategy that worked really well with what he was capable of doing. Right? And accessibility, right? Is the thing I'm after going to be there? Yeah. And it was. It's not stupid. And he's not crazy. Just very, very different from us. Fair enough? I'm not asking you to like it. But I'm asking you to abandon the notion that they're somehow crazy, crazy. Let's remember, he said snootily, that offenders, even violent criminal actors, are a subset of the human race. I'm not asking you to like it. I'm just asking us to admit it. Now, if people don't like this, they tend to grumble, grumble, grumble. So we'll take a little break. You guys can do hubbub, and you guys can do ballyhoo, and then you guys can do contretemps, right? We're mm -hmm. getting very upset. These aren't human beings. They're goblins and trolls and monsters and morlocks and creatures and blah, blah, blah. Well, we don't know anything about it. Goblins, trolls, monsters, morlocks, creatures. We know a whole lot about people, though. Spend a ton of money, literally, trying to figure out how do people work. So we can either use what we know and admit that these are people more like us than they are different, or we can make up a whole bunch of new stuff about whatever it is we think they are. I'm not asking you to like it, but will everyone agree that violent criminal actors, even horrible rapists and murderers, are a subset of the human race? Sure, I get people to want to fight over this. All right, just check it. It's one of the things we know about people and how people work is that our brains have evolved in a way that helps us um, fight a couple of fallacies about decision making. One of the myths about decision making is that if I just had more time and more information, I could make the perfect decision. If you've ever bought a house or a car, though, you know that at some point you just got to pull the trigger. You can't know everything. You can't make sure you're getting the very best deal. You can't know that there's something under the house. Unless you don't want the car, don't want the house, at some point you just got to go, fuck it. Hold your nose and do the best you can. Well, the brain is designed to work incredibly well under conditions that are a nightmare for decision making. No time, no information, life and death risk and you got to decide right now. That's terrible. It sounds like a recipe for disaster, a recipe for death. But weirdly enough, the brain has evolved to make safety, security, survival decisions like that very, very well on the fly. And the way it's happened is that the brain is magically delicious. It's, it's designed and, and, and executed by evolution in three layers that we call the triune brain theory. Your brain is really three brains. At the very bottom, there's just a glorified spinal cord, right? The brain stem. It makes the air go in and out, makes your heart beat, regulates your temperature, all that good stuff. You know, food goes in, poopies go out. None of the stuff you have to think about, that part of the brain is just doing it. The top of the brain is the gray, wrinkly, brainy looking brain, right? It looks like a brain, it's a university. It's full of elevated ideals like beauty and truth and justice and uh, logic and architecture and all that good stuff. Well, if there was a water main busted on the campus of the university, would you want the physics department in charge of fixing it? Drainers. They can have, no, 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 the physics department, all those professors, all those PhDs, think how smart those dudes are. They can tell you why the water's shooting up so high. Maybe they could bring in the geology guys to say why the soil shifted and the pipe broke and all that sort of stuff, right? Great. Would it get the pipe fixed? You know, eventually a guy in overalls will show up and, you know, start digging and fix it. That's the middle of the brain. Not the university, and not the HVAC and the plumbing, right? But the middle, what we call the limbic system. Limbic just means threshold, right? limbic or midbrain. And it's uniquely positioned in that it's right on top of the action brain, meaning it can make your body do stuff without your permission. You've all been driving down the road and swerved around something so quickly that you had to look over your shoulder to see what it was. What was that? Oh, it was a paper bag. 
Midbrain doesn't know that. Midbrain thinks it could be something really bad to run into, like, a, I don't know, a big crate full of engine blocks. Running into that at 70 would be a bad idea. So your midbrain takes over your lower brain, makes your body do something, whether you like it or not. I was rudely introduced to this uh, through a reflex loop once when I was cooking. I reached up to get some spices over the stove, and I braced myself by putting my hand on a live stove. Burner. What didn't happen was I didn't say, goodness, what a peculiar smell, uh, you know, and what an unpleasant sensation, right? What did happen was my hand came off the burner so fast it hit me in the eye. Pow, I got it. And I'm sitting there on the kitchen floor going, ow, 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 trying to figure out how am I going to explain these big old burns and a black eye the next day at work. Prize-winning versions of both, I could tell you. So the midbrain saved my hand without my permission. And yours saves your life without your permission all the time. I mean, it's designed to do this. If you think about it, that decision-making survival brain is right behind your ears. Uh, sorry, right between your ears, right behind your eyes, right? The USB ports of the body, right? Where you take in information, it's, it's on an express highway right to the middle of the brain. It's in charge of saving your life. And what about the brain? Okay, three layers. The mind, then, the, that consciousness that lives in the organ of the brain, how has it evolved to save our lives? Well, it's in halves rather than thirds. And you can think about this as, as your logical mind, right? your reflective mind. It's always thinking about stuff. Right? And your intuitive mind. Your logical mind is conscious. It's aware of itself. It's deliberate. I call it the checklist brain. It likes to do things in order. And it's slow. I put slow in quotes because it ain't slow. Uh, it's just slow compared to the intuitive mind which is literally unbelievably fast. Um, this is where all the stuff you know but aren't thinking about lives. Right? Everything you've ever known is in there. Every single thing you've ever known or experienced is in there. We can't access it though. But your intuitive brain and your, the middle of your brain, excuse me, your intuitive mind and the middle of your brain can. They can access everything you've ever known without your conscious thought. Your intuitive mind is where all of your hunches live, your hunches and impressions about things, and senses of things and feelings, not, not in the sense of emotions, but feelings like, hey, I have a bad feeling about this. That's where it all lives, right? You know that, you know that when you're about to do something stupid and somebody goes, hey, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. That's where it lives. It's so fast you can't believe it, almost literally. But it's not mindless, right? It lives under the university and it has access to every single thing in the university. Every single thing you've ever known is accessible to your intuitive mind and the middle of your brain. The way they conspire, your intuitive mind and the middle of your brain, are in a way of thinking that's called thin slicing. Now, you are not required to hate the author Malcolm Gladwell for the same reasons that I hate him, but you are required to hate oh. I found the seventh circle of hell in Omaha, Nebraska. I really did. I'm walking down the concourse in the airport, and it's a whole display of Malcolm Gladwell books. <laughs> there it is, right out there in public. I'd rather they have, like, ass-raping quarterly available. <laughs> Shocking. Seventh circle of hell in Omaha, Nebraska. Good morning. But so... You can hate him for your own reasons, but you're required to hate him or you can just take it on the heel and tell right now. Um, we hate him because he's a packager of other people's ideas who's gotten rich from it. That's not cool. Science is really hard. The people who do the actual science should get rich and famous, not guys who write about it. Not cool. He did write a book. He's a very clever writer, don't get me wrong. He, he wrote a book called Blink, which is about thin slicing as a method of thinking. Do me a favor. If you buy it, I think you should. Get it at overstock.com or buy it used so he doesn't make any money. All right? That's all I ask. The book is called Blink. A little bitty, teeny bit of book. But the thing about thin slicing, um, as it was discovered by two other scientists, is that it's how the brain works on important stuff when you have almost no information and almost no time. Terrible decision making method, right? Hey, I need you to make the most important decision of your life, life and death. You have no time to do it now. Too late, you're dead. Right? right? This is a nightmare, and yet it works better than it has any business working. It makes use of that adaptive unconscious, right? That part of the mind that that's, knows all the stuff, right? 
and it makes use of all the heuristics, all the weird little things that you've learned along the way. A heuristic is a rule of thumb, right? Like, what, 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 what's a rule of thumb in, in, in your job, whatever you do? Exotic dancing, I know. <laughs> Alright, what kind of practice? Uh, general surgery. Right. Now, if I want to be a general surgeon, is that chapter one, page one, line one, if they look bad, they are bad? No, and yet it's incredibly important, right? My dad's a mostly retired physician. He said, I was, I was teasing him once about heuristics. I said, you know, you got to memorize them all. What's the first one you remember? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, the first one I remember being told, eat now, sleep when you can, and don't touch the pancreas. <laughs> he said, that's, that's the first one you remember being told, right? But really important rules are often just sort of thrown away like that. They're not in the book. They're not chapter one, page one, line one. They're just not. But they kind of ought to be. Uh, electricians have tons of rules, right? Carpenters have tons of rules. I had a letter carrier in class once, and he said, black dogs bite. I never heard that, but then again, I don't have to deal with other people's dogs all day long, and he does. Right? All day, every day. Um, a dermatologist was in class. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I can tell you about dermatology in one sentence. I said, all right. He said, if it's dry, wet it. If it's wet, dry it. If it's not yours, don't touch it. <laughs> okay? That's, it. That's a great rule, right? But rules of thumb like that, you can only get from experience. And the part of your brain that knows them doesn't spend any time thinking. It just knows. The midbrain doesn't think. It just knows. When people say, huh? I ask them this. How long is your car in feet and inches? How long is your car? You're in it every day. You should know this. Well, six feet. <clears throat> Raw guessing. I know one. I know a Crown Victoria is 19 feet 6 inches long. That's it. That's the only one I know. And I don't even drive a Crown Vic. But do you have any trouble finding parking spots? You just kind of know how big your car is, right? You just, I don't know. You drive by, you know, that's too small. Well, that one's good. Until you're in a rental car or a new car. And then you're screwed for a couple of months. And so you just sort of come to know it again. That's the knowing I'm talking about. It's applied knowledge, not abstract knowledge. 